Welcome all. Uh, I'm Ken Ito. I'm the director of the Center for Japanese Studies, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the uh, uh, first noon lecture of uh, this, uh, this academic year's series. Uh, we have uh, a really terrific series lined up for you this term and next. There are flyers on the table, so uh, please uh, please take one and join us as often as you can. Uh, I want to mention that we have uh, a small series within a series this term on uh, Akira Kurosawa, the great Japanese film director. We are showing uh, his great films in fresh new prints on Fridays at 7 p.m. in Lorch. The showings are, are free. Uh, so our film series this year uh, also is uh, very, very special. Uh, flyers on the movies are on the table, so uh, please, uh, please take one. Uh, finally, this uh, coming Monday at uh, uh, 4 p.m. right outside over here, there's a reception for Rieko Kage uh, from the uh, uh, University of Tokyo Department of Political Science. She's our Toyota visiting professor for... Uh, this uh, this academic here, working on civil society in Japan during the occupation period. Very, very exciting scholar to have visiting us. Uh, please come and uh, meet with her. Uh, there's a flyer about uh, the, uh, the reception on the, uh, uh, on, on the table. It's my really great pr pleasure today, or privilege, I should say, to introduce uh, Robert Cole, a distinguished sociologist working on Japan. Robert Cole has been a central figure in Japanese studies here at Michigan. He taught here for 24 years, and he was professor of business administration and sociology until he left us for Berkeley in 1990. He took up a similar joint appointment at Berkeley. He's now professor emeritus in Berkeley School of Business Administration and Department of Sociology. Over his career, Professor Koh has been the leading researcher in the sociology of Japanese industrial relations. His books include the really groundbreaking Japanese Blue Collar, The Changing Tradition, University of California Press in 1971, uh, as well as Work, Mobility, and Participants, A Comparative Study of American and Japanese Industry, University of California Press 1979. Professor Cole has been a longtime analyst of the Japanese automobile industry. He was the director of the U.S. Japan Auto Study, which in the 1980s produced reliable studies of the Japanese automobile industry in an era, in an era when trade fiction, friction filled the media with all kinds of misinformation. It's a special pleasure to welcome back Professor Cole because he's a former director of this Center for Japanese Studies. In this role, he played a key role in securing the endowment that now supports the Toyota Visiting Professor Program. It's safe to say that Bob's impact is still being felt at the center through the wonderful scholars whom we get to know through the TV pre-program. The uh, title of uh, Professor Cole's uh, talk today is Toyota's quali Quality Problems, How Serious, What Can We Learn From Them? It's a great pleasure to be back at Ann Arbor. Uh, the center was a big part of my life here, and uh, actually it remains a big part of my life. If I had known earlier that this was uh, the first fall brown bag as uh, homage to Ed Seiden's sticker, I would have entitled it differently. I would have titled it Toyota's Long Hot Summer. <laughs> For those of you new to the center, that's a play on the title of the opening fall brown bag that was given annually by my old colleague, Ed Seidensticker, world-class translator <coughs> and author. It was always a wide-ranging talk about his experiences in Tokyo the previous months. Uh, Ed liked to stir the pot. Uh, he used to go to Yomiuri Giant Games in the era of the Yomiuri Giants' dominance and he would go there to root against them. <laughs> and at one point, I recall, he uh, got into a brawl with some Yomiuri Giants fans who uh, had a different view of their team. And as I recall, he was arrested. So I tell you this because uh, uh, Ed was not one to shy away from controversy. And uh, I'd like to think that he uh, would have enjoyed uh, today's talk. So. 
on to the talk. If quality experts uh, were to name the one company that most personifies the modern quality movement in industry, it would certainly be Toyota. So the recent events of their quality failures has been uh, an extraordinary shock. Uh, before documenting the scope of their problems, let me first deal with the conspiracy theories, uh, and relatedly those who seek to minimize the problems. So there's one camp advocating conspiracy which sees the unfolding events as a plot by the Obama administration. <laughs> don't laugh, don't laugh, not too much anyway. Uh, as a plot by the Obama administration to help GM. Uh, and actually, that view is fairly prevalent in Japan. Uh, on the other side, uh, there are those who see Toyota as conspiring to conceal the true source of unintended acceleration. It's car electronics, they say. And it turns out that group is pretty prominent in the United States. So uh, uh, we're engaged in dueling conspiracy theories. Uh, it's certainly not hard to find evidence that the US media and grandstanding politicians have exaggerated and exploited Toyota's problems. It would be hard to argue with that point. Moreover, the National Highway Safety Traffic Administration, NHTSA, is taking a harder line towards Toyota uh, after having been accused of having coddled them in the past. But perhaps the more important point is that uh, with the arrival of the Obama administration, uh, there was a signal, to all, a signal to, all, to all automakers that they now faced a tougher regulatory environment. There is simply no credible evidence that the Obama administration is targeting uh, uh, Toyota, much less doing it effectively. Uh, on the other side, preliminary studies do not find any evidence so far that the real source of unintended acceleration was car electronics. So again, there's no evidence for that position. Uh, rather, so far, driver error seems to be the uh, dominant uh, uh, explanation, even though we haven't accounted for all of the cases. Uh, there are, by the way, there are other still wackier uh, conspiracy theories, uh, but I'll spare you the, uh, the elaboration. Oh, there's at least someone here who knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, those who point out the inordinate impact of the media also believe that uh, Toyota's problems are vastly exaggerated, and in fact that they're pretty modest. Uh, from November, 19, uh, November 2009, to the end of August 2010, just uh, recently, some 12 million Toyotas, including their Lexus brand, have been recalled worldwide, 12 million. Now the minimizers point out that these, to these totals don't mean that there's 12 million problems. First they say there was the 2009 recall of unsecured aftermarket all-weather car mats uh, for unintended uh, acceleration just one problem. Then came the Toyota announcement uh, that there was the sticky gas pedal problem, another source of unintended acceleration, and there was another recall. So now we got two problems. And by the way, the, the sticky gas pedal uh, was a part produced by uh, one supplier, CTS Corporation, an American corporation. A fact that some Japanese observers like to point out to imply it's really American workers and American managers that uh, are the source of the Toyota problems. That explanation, again, is pretty popular in Japan. I'll come back to that a little later with some more information. Then came the revelation about the Prius brake problem. Again, just one more problem. This one caused by one software error. So limiting ourselves to the 9 million recalls worldwide as of February 8th, the minimizers would say, well, basically, there were just three problems. That's hardly a breakdown in quality. Uh, 
Uh, let's see if I can manage uh, to see where we're going here. So operationally, we can say of as of February 8th, they had three problems. Uh, but we can look at this matter in another way. From the perspective of 9 million Toyota owners, it's actually 9 million problems. And this is according to Toyota's own traditional formula, guiding principle of customer first. A significant number of those owners might not be repeat buyers going forward. They uh, are likely to be less, uh, less likely to recommend Toyota to their friends and family. A Toyota Commission survey a few years ago found that 30% 30, 30 of U.S. owners, car owners, said having a recall on their current vehicle would make them seriously consider not buying that vehicle again. With quality, uh, perception is everything. Uh, a late uh, February Gallup poll, national survey, found 31% of respondents had come to believe that Toyota vehicles are unsafe. Now, it doesn't matter how much the media might have hyped the problem or the politicians politicized it, and surely they did. Customer perception is what it is, and those customer perceptions translate into serious quality problem for Toyota. But there is an unfolding big picture since February 8th. If there had been only three recalls related to unintended acceleration, despite the uh, difficulty of that issue, it would have been easier for Toyota to restore its pristine quality reputation. But actually, Hardly a week has gone by since February 1st, 2010, without a Toyota recall for one problem or another from both old and new models. And to be specific, there were 14 NHTSA safety recalls from February 1st to September 1st, in addition to 11 voluntary recalls by Toyota during that same period. That's a total of 25 recalls over 30 weeks. And those recalls were for a whole range of different defects. They weren't for unintended acceleration. The automakers, to be sure, all the automakers are now in a uh, new environment of closer government scrutiny. Uh, just by way of comparison, the 14 NHTSA Toyota recalls uh, compare in that same time period to 5 for Ford, 11 for Nissan, 7 for Honda, and 10 for GM. So much for uh, government favoritism of GM. Uh, but in the case of Toyota, there's the added negative publicity arising from its fine from NHTSA for being slow to report its safety problems. As a consequence uh, of all this... Uh, attention, Toyota and the other automakers have decided really to be more proactive, uh, to issue voluntary recalls when possible, because there's less stigma attached to voluntary recalls by consumers uh, than NHTSA required ones. From January 1st to September 1st, just a few days ago, there have been 23.5 million vehicle recall notices issued to car owners in the United States. Toyota accounted for roughly half of them, well above what you might expect from its 15% market share, 50.2% to be precise. And I believe that that succession of recalls, not just the original three, but the succession of recalls has cemented in the public mind that Toyota has real quality problems beyond unintended acceleration. Let me say something about media attention. Uh, most importantly for public perception, the cumulative Toyota recalls appear to be getting far more publicity than those of other automakers. Now, that might strike some people as unfair. Um, 
Well, the media doesn't quite work that way, I don't think. Uh, and it doesn't arise from a plot to get Toyota. It's a combination of the fact that Toyota had this stellar quality reputation. It is incredibly newsworthy when they fall from grace. So, and then on top of the original recalls, the huge recalls the, for unintended acceleration, it's hardly surprising that each recall they do gets a lot of media attention. Again, I don't see that as a plot by anyone to get Toyota. Uh, and by the way, to give you a sense of how much media attention, in the first week of February, uh, it was the second most widely disseminated story across all U.S. media. Second. Uh, actually accounted for 11% of all new, uh, media coverage. Uh, that includes internet, newspapers, uh, everything that they can measure, that is. There's a great website called Project on Excellence in, in Journalism, by the way, which, which tabulates weekly what the leading stories are across all media. Uh, and what about that media coverage? Yes, it was a feeding frenzy. And yes, many of the reports were inflammatory uh, by leading with victim stories. But that's what newspaper guys do, you know? You lead with the personal human interest story. And yes, the media reports ignored the low probability of unintended acceleration. But I'll tell you what, the media are not very good at handling risk and probability. That's not. That's not the way they make money. Uh, so it wasn't anything about Toyota particularly. Uh, the media are terrible at handling risk and pro probability. And in fact, the general public is even worse at handling risk and probability. But again, I see no conspiracy. Um, so we've been talking a lot about perception, but let's talk a little bit about, uh, if you will, objective reality. Um, I think you all know Consumer Reports, well-known, respected, influential nonprofit reports on consumer products. Uh, reflecting on the data on this slide showing uh, Toyota's quality performance, <clears throat> the head of automotive testing at, CA, at CR, customer, uh, Consumer Reports, stated, and by the way, I, I interviewed him for uh, my research in this area, uh, but this was in the public press. He, uh, he said, quote, the quality of Toyota vehicles has measurably declined in recent years, end of quote. He reports problems with transmissions, brakes, squeaks and rattles, deterioration in fit and finish, and in the quality of some materials in various models. Nor has their Lexus brand, luxury brand, been immune. Toyota's Lexus brand uh, fell from first to fifth in Consumer Reports' annual predicted reliability survey uh, among luxury cars in 2007. Now, these are incredibly damning statements coming from a magazine, and uh, if you talk to car people, they will uh, recognize the expression I'm, uh, I'm about to use. Uh, a magazine that has had a love affair with Toyota for the last 30 years. So. This is not a, a magazine given to flippant sort of uh, off-the-cuff remarks. Uh, for them to say this, uh, they had to be pretty strongly convinced that something was going on here. Uh, I can also cite the results of the recent J.D. Power survey. Uh, this is the second most widely used evaluator of, uh, of auto quality. Um, they look at uh, owner-reported problems in the first 90 days of ownership. Uh, the industry average for 2010 was 109 problems per 100 vehicles. 109 problems per 100 vehicles. Uh, Toyota owners reported 117 problems per 100 vehicles, so over the average. And that was up dramatically from the previous year where they reported 101 problems uh, per 100 vehicles. And correspondingly, Toyota's brand ranking in that particular survey fell from seventh position in 2009 to 21st position out of 33. Um, the point I'm trying to make here uh, is that, quite apart from perception, which may well have been inflamed by the media, 
Toyota has real objective quality problems as manifested in the successive recalls, the decline in ratings in Consumer Reports and J.D. Power. But Toyota has another problem, as if that wasn't enough. It turns out the fall off in absolute measures of reliability and the growth of recalls in the last few years is not Toyota's real quality problem. Its real problem, as shown in the slide, is that its failings have coincided with key competitors rapidly closing the reliability gap. So while Toyota over the whole decade actually improved its reliability, competitors have improved even faster. Ordinarily, just equaling a long-term quality leader is not enough to dislodge them. But combined with the success of Toyota recalls, the recent quality fall-off as documented by Consumer Reports, these developments offer competitors great new opportunities. And this is particularly true of Hyundai, which has combined its strong reliability improvement with aggressive pricing. Uh, thus far, Hyundai, Kia, and Ford have been the major beneficiaries of Toyota's uh, quality problems. A March 2010 Roper National Survey found that 38% of Americans now think, I never thought I would see this day, I have to admit, uh, now think that 38% of Amer I'm sorry, 38% of Americans now think that U.S. firms make higher quality cars than their Asian rivals. 38%, while 33% chose Asian brands. And accounting for most of that change, Toyota plunged from 25% to 15%, while Ford doubled its 9% figure to 18%. So in short, Toyota's dominance as quality leader has been seriously undermined by the current quality problems and the gains made by able competitors. If you think about Toyota's marketing strategy over the last uh, decade or two decades, uh, their, their product was marketed as quality, reliability, durability, with an added emphasis on value. And that was how they distinguished themselves from their competitors. It wasn't by trying to say we had better design, we had better performance. So this, this uh, weakening of their quality performing strikes at the heart of the dominance of the brand. Uh, it's a pretty serious matter in my judgment, contrary to what a lot of analysts, analysts have said. Let's talk now about what might be the root causes of the Toyota problem. And uh, let me just say that uh, the overview I'm about to give you in the next three slides is based on my research of Toyota's quality practices beginning some 30 years ago, my recent experiences uh, teaching executives at Toyota in Japan, my discussions with retired Toyota managers, and my exchange of uh, views with other automotive researchers, including Japanese automotive researchers. I usually don't like to read slides, but let me just uh, uh, emphasize the point. Uh, the, the transformation really took place with the arrival of Hiroshi Okuda as uh, president of Toyota in 1995. He set in motion this huge growth strategy to increase global market share. And um, when they reached, uh, they had originally set a goal of 10%. When they reached 9.7, they set a new target, 15% by 2010. And they were actually on their way to that goal uh, when the financial meltdown hit and then, of course, the recall debacle. Uh, it was understood by everyone at Toyota and indeed around the world uh, in auto circles that the 15% target meant surpassing GM as the global volume leader. And it meant expanding the Toyota system to new global locations. 
Toyota managers aggressively acted on those growth targets. They surpassed GM in 2008. From, uh, from 2000, the year 2000, global sales at Toyota, including Lexus, grew at an amazing rate of 600,000 vehicles a year. You know, this is a really complex product. I mean, that's an astounding number. I would argue, however, that it is very difficult for any organization producing a complex product like an automobile to elevate quantity as the clear number one goal while simultaneously focusing on providing the highest quality. Organizational incentives, whether informal or formal, have a way of skewing to the primary target. And if that sounds too sociological uh, or uh, jargon-filled, let me just put it at an individual level. If your boss says to you that your pay and promotion is 90% uh, dependent on how many widgets you produce, and it's 10% dependent on how much quality you have, I can tell you what's going to happen to quality in that environment. In a nutshell, I think that's what happened at Toyota, writ large. Toyota's uh, way of thinking has always been customer first, traditionally customer first. And it's exemplified in a slogan that's often used not only at Toyota but other Japanese manufacturing firms, QCD quality cost delivery in that order. And the notion was that if you got your quality right, your costs would come down and you would get the volume you wanted. You would get the increase in sales. I don't believe that President Okuda ever intended to reverse that formula. Uh, I think what happens often is that strong leaders, whether in Japan or the US, always underestimate the impact of their uh, statements, their uh, criteria by which they're going to measure people. Uh, they always underestimate how that gets transformed and transmuted as that message makes its way down the organizational layers. So hypergrowth, I think, uh, was one of the root causes. And this first root cause, hypergrowth, interacts with the second root cause, which is the growing technical complexity of automobiles. Uh, by the way, I owe some of this discussion to my colleague in Japan, Takahiro Fujimoto, who is uh, considered the dean of automotive uh, <coughs> researchers in Japan. Uh, vehicles have become much more complex and at an accelerating rate. Uh, Toyota engineers developed extraordinarily elaborate and complex electronic control systems as a means of modularizing their designs, maximizing fuel economy, safety, stability. Um, the sophisticated vehicles demanded by customers in the developed economies now contain software with more than 10 million lines of code. Um, this is up from maybe two or three million lines of code in the year 2000. And in fact, that number is exponentially increasing. By 2015, it's going to be way larger. Uh, the average car now contains 60 electronic control units. It literally, we're getting a computer on wheels. So extraordinary complexity, accelerating. Like all automakers, Toyota struggled to cope with the increasing functional complexity. But in their case, they made it a lot harder because they were trying to do this at the same time that they were rapidly expanding capacity. They were expanding the number of models. And they were, they were trying to do this all with an expanding global organization. So think of what that added to the, the challenge was big enough for every automaker. 
But then to do that on top of this extraordinary burst of growth, the challenge is particularly large, by the way, for uh, vehicles with complex designs such as mass-produced luxury cars and, and hybrids, you know, the Lexus, the Prius. Uh, but again, man meeting all these challenges, uh, as good as Toyota is, and they are a very good company, this was simply too much even for them. It just stressed their systems in so many different ways, particularly their human resources, in so many different ways that I'm convinced it created the conditions for multiple quality failures. One way to... Uh, one way to sort of see if that analysis is correct is to look at its impact on supplier management. As is well known, a great deal of the value of automobiles comes from products contributed by suppliers. So we must consider what was the impact of Toyota's hypergrowth, vehicles growing technical complexity on supplier management. And what we know to date points to these three factors. Uh, I would be the first to admit uh, we don't have hard evidence on these factors, but they are consistent with what we do know. Not long ago, a high-level Toyota executive uh, uh, publicly acknowledged that facing internal manpower shortages resulting from their rapid growth, they expanded the use of a large number of inexperienced contract engineers in order to boost their engineering capabilities. And he conceded that this, this led to, the, to the, uh, some of the increases of what he calls quality glitches. I love that term. Another senior uh, Toyota uh, engineer reported again publicly that the company had come to use outside engineers as much as, uh, to do as much as 30% of its development work globally. That's an amazing figure, 30%. And that's a sharp, sharp increase uh, from the past. Uh, and indeed, in recognition of the quality problems this uh, can create through miscommunication, through the difficulty of assessing uh, competence of these people, uh, Toyota has recently announced in the aftermath of the recalls that they're seeking to reduce that percentage back down to 10%. Uh, so it seems to me that's a pretty good indicator that they saw this as one of their problems. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the CTS uh, brake pedal module, the sticky gas pedal that we mentioned earlier, the alleged major factor in many unintended acceleration cases. Um, no one at Toyota denies that the detailed design and the material choices uh, were done by CTS Corporation, not by Toyota, an independent contractor in the U.S. But, and this is critical, Toyota, per its standard policies, has full responsibility for approving that design, including the materials used. Uh, they typically provide testing instructions, for example, to the supplier uh, in terms of uh, certifying that this, this particular component meets all of to Toyota's specifications. Well, I'm told by my Japanese contacts that CTS used a relatively inferior material in the design of its friction levers, and that that was the source of the problem. Um, and as internal manpower shortages increased, it appears that less experienced engineers were increasingly put in charge of monitoring suppliers. Given the uh, problems that arose at CTS, it certainly appears that Toyota's monitoring of that design process and the outcome was insufficient. So for, uh, I, I, whenever I uh, talk about this with uh, people who have just come from Japan somehow, my Japanese friends, they always like to point out the CTS issue. Um, but it's absurd. Uh, Toyota had responsibility for approval of that design. So to blame US workers or managers for the problem is totally unacceptable, totally unacceptable.
It's a basic, basic principle of risk management, which every corporation knows about. Uh, it's simply uh, try to identify your risk early and try to correct them when they're small. Pretty good common sense. I think we could all recognize that. It's actually a basic principle of quality management as well. So, did Toyota have ample warning that uh, their quality problems were accelerating? They sure did. Um, I'll give you one specific example, and then I'll make uh, I'll provide a general uh, general one. Um, if we look at the sticky gas pe uh, pedal problem. It was first reported in March 2007 on the Tundra pickup truck in the United States. They replaced what they believed to be the faulty part. But in December 2008, they received complaints in Europe over the new part. So what they did was they replaced the new part again in Europe. But geez, they forgot to tell the Americans. Part was not replaced in the United States. They took no further action. That's the, the uh, specific. The general one. In January 2008, Chris Tinto, a uh, US high-ranking uh, Toyota executive, gave an internal presentation at Toyota headquarters. You might ask how I know this. I know this because it was revealed in the discovery documents that, supply, uh, that Toyota supplied to Congress, which I've uh, looked over fairly carefully. In that Toyota presentation by Chris Tinto, he gave some warnings. A and let me quote, some of the quality issues we are experiencing are showing up in defect investigations, rear gas struts, ball joints, etc. Although we rigorously defend our products through good negotiation and analysis, we now have a less defensible product. We now have a less defensible product. Could there be any clearer statement that the information was there? They should have acted. They should have known this. They should have acted on basic principle of risk management. Let's turn now from identifying causes to what are the prospects for Toyota recovery, its quality reputation. And fully recovering its quality reputation could mean restoring its global market share, 13.8% in 2008, resuming its upward trajectory in sales, maintaining its gross profit margins, which are an, were an incredible 23.8% in 2008, uh, it, has some made, it has made some progress on the sales front uh, in the, uh, since the uh, initial recalls because it's uh, greatly increased its incentives in the U.S. market. Toyota increased its average incentive per vehicle paid to dealers and or customers from, from uh, uh, last year to $902 to $2,204 today. Despite those efforts, it still lost 1.4% market share in the U.S. in the first eight months of the year, uh, and, with ex and that's with the expanded incentives. Uh, uh, and with those expanded incentives, it clearly suffered uh, a reduction in gross margins. Uh, I want to capture the challenge through this quote that you see uh, on this slide. Uh, this comes from an interview I did 20 years ago. I dug it out. Um, it was an interview with Isao Nakatsuka, who was the quality leader at a major Toyota supplier. And he made the statement shown in the slide. And I, uh, I, I, I call your attention to the very last sentence. If we betray their trust, they will not buy our products for a long time. Uh, now, you could see that as prophetic, uh, but actually time will tell. Uh, it, it's not necessarily the case, of course. Um, until recently, U.S. survey results showed that twice as many customers intending to purchase a new vehicle trusted Toyota more than they did Ford and GM. Until recently. Uh, we don't know what those numbers look like today, but we do know that Toyota has put that trust in jeopardy.
Notice the shift. I'll, I'll come. Well, I'll, let me uh, let me introduce it first. Uh, we can examine the uh, the durability of the effects of such quality failures, as well as the relationship between perceived and objective quality. Uh, despite growing amounts of information, it turns out consumers form their perceptions of automotive quality on what is often very limited and very particularistic information. And more often they, and moreover, they often hold on to their views despite being exposed to objective data to the contrary. This suggests that even after Toyota fixes all its problems, and I'm sure it will, by the way, there will be residual negative impact on its quality reputation. So I want you to consider the following. Many consumers formed a negative view of the Ford brand based on the high profile media accounts of incidents involving the Explorer Firestone tire failures in 2000, 2001, and Ford's alleged cover up. Ford was actually able to fix the problem pretty quickly by changing its tire suppliers, redesigning what they came to advertise as the all new 2002 Explorer. But guess what? They didn't recover their market position in this market, light trucks, which is the most profitable market segment uh, in their business. You notice they had market leadership over GM in 1999, 2000. Let's see, where does it shift in uh, 2001, right? Yeah, 01. It shifts in 2001, and they never get it back. People had that in their heads, and uh, you don't dislodge that information easily. So there's actually no direct connection between objective quality and consumer demand. Quality perception matters. And while many uh, of industry analysis, since this happened, since the first recalls, Industry analysis analysts have been predicting that Toyota is going to recover pretty quickly. Uh, I've had the view all along that uh, it's going to be a lot tougher. And everything that's happened since then uh, confirms me in, in, in my view. Um, it's amazing to me that in April 2010 survey by Consumer Reports, they reported that Toyota had been replaced as the auto firm with the top brand loyalty by Honda and Ford. Uh, it would have been hard to imagine that. Oh, and one thing more, uh, apropos media coverage. This got tremendous media coverage. Uh, some people are acting as if uh, Toyota again has, and I think a lot of Japanese feel this way, that Toyota has somehow been singled out for this, you know, uh, explosive media coverage. But when public safety is at issue, which it was in the Ford case, the media coverage is enormous. And it was in that case as well. And was it over the top then too? Probably. I haven't gone back and actually looked closely at it. Maybe that's a, a, a something I should do. So let me now talk about some obstacles that Toyota faces in trying to recover. Uh, I think there are a lot of factors working against them. They also have some things going for them, of course. Uh, the cardinal rule for effective crisis management is listen to early warning signals, react quickly, exude humility, transparency, get the full story out quickly, no stonewalling. Of course, we should keep in mind that in any case like this, corporate lawyers are always recommending the opposite. They're trying to contain litigation costs. Don't admit too much. Don't admit anything you have to. So in a way, there was no good choices for Toyota. The first obstacle is, the re is reflected in the findings of national survey conducted at the end of February. 55% of American vehicle owners said they believe that Toyota was slow to report its safety issues. And certainly, this was the overwhelming consensus of automotive experts, both in Japan and the US. Even the Japanese 
even uh, the Japanese press, which, you know, sort of leaned over backward to try to defend its icon, acknowledged, yeah, they certainly screwed up. They were slow to report. The trouble is, being slow to report makes it easy, particularly for the conspiracy theorists, by the way, to charge that you're engaged in a cover-up. So you really open the door to the conspiracy theorists when you're slow to report information. And it contributes to further eroding customer trust. And adding substance to these views, the U.S. Transportation Department fined Toyota $16.4 million, the highest fine it had ever fined an automobile company and the maximum allowed, for knowingly hiding safety defects from regulators. Specifically, they determined that Toyota failed to notify regulators of the sticky gas pedal defect in certain models for four months after they knew about it. You're required to notify them after five days when you know about it. So in short, Toyota didn't display a lot of transparency. They were slow to act on warnings. By the way, there's a similar case of delayed reporting regarding steering problems from, from 2005, which is now being explored uh, by a federal grand jury. So there may be some more dropping of shoes. The second obstacle arises because, how are we doing on time? Oh, not great. Um, Second obstacle arises because some earlier recalls for safety problems in the U.S., uh, unlike, I should say, uh, other safety problems, this cuts across many models. So that makes it hard to just discontinue that model and then hope the problem will go away. It cuts across a range of models. It affects the brand. I'm going to move a little faster now, if I may, because I want to leave time for questions. Uh, a third issue is uh, there are a set of events that are going to keep this matter alive in the public mind. I just mentioned one, the federal grand jury. Um, there's going to be continuing publicity uh, because of a, a whole bunch of litigation that is going to go forward. Uh, there is congr uh, continuing congressional scrutiny. There is proposed new safety legislation, which is growing directly out of this. Uh, and, of course, there's the succession of recalls, uh, which has kept the matter alive in the public mind. Not good news for Toyota. Um, congressional testimony uh, by Toyota did not inspire confidence. I don't have time to go into detail, but it didn't. Um, fifth obstacle, consumer reports. I told you earlier, uh, I'll add one piece of information about consumer reports. If you look at surveys of what determines consumer purchase decision, the, the organization with the most influence in the United States is Consumer Reports. So when that institution, that organization <coughs> says, these guys got problems now, they got problems. And lastly, as I pointed out, um, Toyota now has some strong quality competitors that it didn't have in the past. Uh, since this is an academic audience largely, though I know it not entirely, I can tell by, by watching people's body language as I was talking. Who are the auto people and who are not the auto people? Um, uh, Toyota clearly responded to the crisis with too little too late. When I do this for an industry audience, I have a section on, instead of this, I would have lessons for other industries. But for an academic audience, we're going to go this route. So recall decisions and information was centralized in Japan with too little outside input. Uh, it made Toyota insensitive to local regulations, customer sentiment in other countries, and politics. Executives in Toyota in charge of recalls have been accustomed to a pretty accommodating regulatory environment in Japan. That's the world they lived in. Uh, there was information, for example, about unintended acceleration occurring with comparable models in Europe, which was not available to U.S. executives because that information went directly to Toyota headquarters. 
Um, of particular, th- uh, what I'm about to say now is really, really blew my mind, I guess is the uh, only way to describe it. There were uh, some depositions taken in July. Uh, I believe this was, I don't know if it was in, yeah, I think it was in connection with a lawsuit, um, by two leading Toyota-based uh, American executives. And they stated that consumer complaints, customer complaints regarding steering problems in SUVs were funneled directly to Toyota headquarters and not available to them. Now think about what that means. These top executives didn't even know the number of customer complaints. Top U.S. executives in the company didn't know the number of of customer complaints about Toyota models in the U.S. One of these guys said, and I'm quoting here, Toyota headquarters is a kind of brain of the company. We don't have any independent knowledge outside of them, end of quote. I, 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 when I read that, I just, I, I, I was just, just, I was just shocked. I don't know how else to describe it. It's truly amazing. Uh, what I'd like to say now is that the approach Toyota took, which in some ways is not unique to Toyota, but common of other Japanese multinationals, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that, poses some interesting challenges for academic theories about Japanese organizations. In the uh, scholarly literature characterizing Japanese organizations, uh, Masahiko Aoki has been extremely influential, uh, a recently retired professor from Stanford, uh, a very capable guy, and I have enormous respect for his work, and I've learned a lot from him. And uh, he sees the strength of Japanese manufacturing organizations, the stylized J firm, as he calls them, lying in the decentralization of information and decision-making. The ultimate example, we're all familiar with the stereotype of the uh, assembly line worker at uh, Toyota, given the decision right to stop the production line, and and not only that, but given the training and the tools to identify problems and solve them and implement them. The other part of Aoki's argument is also that he stresses the easy horizontal flow of information across divisions with complementary functions. And what he means by that is, if a firm would benefit from two different divisions sharing information, like in uh, relating to product development and manufacturing, the Japanese are extremely good at doing that. And indeed, the auto industry is given as a major example as evidence for his theory. But apparently that famed decentralization of information in knowledge and decision rights and especially the easy horizontal flow across complementary divisions didn't apply to Toyota's top foreign executives in global locations and divisions. I think Toyota's behavior here is pretty consistent with findings over many years that compared to U.S. and European multinationals, uh, Japanese firm multinationals tend to grant the least autonomy Uh, to their foreign operations. And I think that speaks to the closed nature of Japanese culture, the privileged position of Japanese nationals as core firm members versus foreign outsiders. Um, In my judgment, uh, and I'm expanding the argument here, uh, it's related to the slow pace of true globalization in Japan. Uh, So the practical lesson here I believe is executives in local markets to be effective need both global and local information, and in the case of auto, clearly need to have a strong voice in recall def- decisions. Toyota has announced that they're doing this, but it's a bit of closing the barn door after the horses are gone. And scholars writing on Japanese organizations need to rethink their organizational theories and how applicable they are under globalization. Okay, last slide. What? Uh, mm-hmm. um, well, you can tell from my prognosis uh, that I think they face uh, an uphill climb. Uh, that doesn't mean they can't do it. Uh, this is uh, an amazing company. I've uh, grown, to, grown to respect this company and what they've accomplished 
uh, since I first started uh, uh, visiting them, I did some work at Toyota Auto Body in 1979. Uh, it was a long time ago. And I was, I've been working in the automobile industry actually since 1966. Um, that means I'm old, I guess. Um, <coughs> Toyota has a lot of tools at its disposal. Its low cost structure, for example, allows them to price aggressively, uh, to win back sales. Uh, they are, as I mentioned, doing a lot of incentives. But if you keep incentives on too long, it damages brand uh, because it damages resale value of cars. Uh, so Toyota has to be really careful about its incentives. Uh, here's another point. You know, a lot of the conversation today and, uh, and almost all the discussion in the U.S. Uh, press focuses, of course, on Toyota in the U.S. market. But think about Toyota in the major growth markets of the world. The major growth markets are Brazil, China, what am I forgetting? In India. In India. Yeah, Brazil, China, and India. Russia. Well, Russia has kind of fallen out yes, of that category right, lately. The right, right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But uh, if you look at the recent discussions, Russia Russia's in pretty bad shape right now. Um, well, Toyota doesn't have much of a presence in those markets. Uh, Brazil, they're almost, they're about, they're building a new uh, uh, assembly plant, uh, but uh, they've been really slow. Um, the China is the case I know best, and uh, there has been enormous publicity in China over these Toyota quality problems. So the Chinese know about it. Maybe not so much in the inland areas, but certainly in the coastal areas. And unlike the U.S., China doesn't have a huge loyal group of customers that over the years have sworn by their Toyotas. So they don't have, uh, it will be interesting to see how it plays out in the China market. Actually, I'm going to give this talk in Shanghai uh, in uh, November, and I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll spend some time trying to figure out uh, what the impact of this is uh, in, in China, and I'll be interested to see how people respond. Um, but uh, they could have uh, some pretty serious problems. These are the major growth markets of the world, those three countries. <clears throat> and if, uh, if you're not growing there, well, you're not growing your global market share for sure. So it's a big challenge. <clears throat>